I saw a documentary film last night and um, I kind of like regretted watching it particularly at 12.30 a.m. because I wasn't going to be able to fall asleep right away after watching that. It took me several hours. I had to take Valerian route finally and I cried for like an hour after I saw that film and it was I thought I was never going to stop crying again. I it it really felt like it. I, f I felt like it was it was like turning me inside out that feeling, that grief that I felt. It's a story of an elephant baby in Africa, I think South Africa, there is a conservationist group, they're very warm-hearted, wonderful, sweet people that are rescuing wild animals and rehabilitating them. They are often finding infant giraffes, infant pigs, sheep, wild boar, and um, infant elephants and infant rhinoceroses. They rescue the baby animals and they give them formula to drink and they help them and they nurse them to health and they grow and when they are juveniles and when they are strong enough to fend for themselves they bring them back to the wild places where there's other herds of elephants and giraffes and rhinoceros. So they rescued this baby elephant and they, they, they rescued a sheep to give the baby elephant company and they also rescued a baby giraffe. And they all became really, really close friends. And particularly the sheep and the elephant bonded so closely. And then I hear people say on YouTube, uh, bullshit comments like uh, like for example they had this dog painting something with a brush thing in his mouth and he was painting on a paper and, and somebody says well that's just like uh, putting paint on worms and letting them slither over the the, the 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 sheet of paper you know and that's absolutely I mean I see these type of comments all the time like they will equate mammals with insects or with grass or with corn. Uh, I've heard it all, you know. So that's why I'm making these videos because all mammals have the same nervous system. I am so grateful that in 2012 in July a panel of scientists that are uh, working in the field of the brain, brain anatomy, neurology, neu neuroanatomical research and so on. And they all declared uh, f from all over the world and Stephen Hawking was there. And all these important, very, very brainy people were there and they unanimously declared that all mammals, some birds and even some invertebrates, but the the very evolved ones, the octopus, they have high cognitive function, just like humans. High cognitive function. So a dog has high cognitive function, not to the level of doing very abstract thinking their field is a different one. They didn't need this high abstract thinking to survive. Those are, those are pack animals, they help each other, they're very social animals, that's why they survived. They have infinite love in them and they'll do anything to rescue their friend, okay? To me that is not compared to an invertebrate, you know, that's not, you know, I mean, it is obvious that they have real high cognitive function. One of the one of the areas of intelligence areas is ethics, is high ethics, is compassion and love. That's ethics. 
the ability to feel compassion for another living being, regardless of their species. So, whales and dolphins have that too, to the fullest extent, just like dogs, and maybe even more. And, and they also have different individuals living among them. They're not all the same, they have different characters, just like among humans. And um, it is a slow adaptation process, very, very slow. You know. So we have different individuals, but most dolphins and whales have extreme ethics, much more than humans. So, and not only that, they have also extreme high cognitive function, higher than humans. This is this has also been discovered now, and. Uh, Dr. Lori Moreno and Dr. Jack Kasowitz and, and several other people are working on a communication bridge with the ocean mammals, particularly the cetaceans, the whales and the dolphins. And in particular dolphins, because dolphins are extremely sociable and curious animals, they come up to people, they check them out, they communicate with them, and it, it's a, the most touching things happen there in, in the ocean with fisher people sometimes. Fisher people go out there, they throw their nets out and they don't know what they're doing. They, I wish I could speak to them. I wish I could speak directly to their hearts because, I mean, the amygdala. Maybe we can grow the amygdala. Maybe we can do, do this. Maybe we can make it happen. Um, I guess most fishermen, they're just interested in making a quick buck, you know, they don't care very much. They, and they're not informed that they are catching marine mammals in those nets, you know, that are a, as evolved as humans are and even more. So one time they, they caught a baby dolphin that looks like a little, like a rubber duck that you put in a, in a bathtub. I mean, like, like a foot long and a little girl and the fisher people they were getting their catch and they find this baby dolphin all wrapped in that net and they often die from this that's why i say don't buy tuna or even if it says dolphin safe don't believe it because they throw these big large gigantic nets out the commercial fisher people throw gigantic nets out and all kinds of weird reeling stuff and where animals get caught in and they die gruesome death in there. Anyway, they, they, they were, the, these fisher people in particular that made this one video, that's the most touching thing I've, I've ever seen with the happy ending. Um, they had a heart, they saw this baby dolphin and they thought that was very cute. They unraveled this baby little rubber duck looking thing and um, you will not believe it. This, is th this, this video should be celebrated as the best video in the world. That's what I think. I give it a hundred stars or infinite stars. Because when, once they unraveled this, this little baby dolphin, this um, wet, slick, gray, uh, smooth thing, you know, with the blowhole on the top. They unraveled her and she went out there and she flipped up in the air and she was doing these flips like she was walking on water and she was looking right at them and she was like, thank you, 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 like, and she was doing a dance for them. And that is the most touching thing I've ever seen. And the, the Fisher people, they were very deeply touched by this. They, I don't even think they have really put much thought in this before. Those are mammals, they give birth, they, they're like, they nurse, they, they give milk. They're like humans and dogs and horses, the same thing. It's just that they, they are living in the ocean, that's the only difference. And things have evolved differently, you know, different adaptations, different abilities have evolved because they live in the ocean, you know, they have to come to the surface to breathe through that blowhole and it, it sounds just like you breathing when you're swimming, you know, like 
you know, and they're spitting some water out with it. So yeah, it is. It is. It is those are amazing animals, unbelievable. And my hero is Paul Watson because he rescues those. He he's he's their their godfather. You know, he's their their um, big brother who's helping them, and we should all support him hundred percent. So back to the elephant, which was not. A happy ending and what happened is they rescued this ba elephant baby and he bonded with the sheep and so it, it was the, the sheep almost died the sheep had at some point had an infection but they were able to rescue the sheep and to give him antibiotics and he was feeling a lot better the next day and they were running again together and the elephant would always put his trunk like snake the trunk over the, the, the back of the sheep and, and rub him and pet him like that. I mean, unbelievable. Elephants also have spindle cells in the brain, which were found in whales, dolphins, humans also, and I think in um, chimpanzees too. So, and these spindle cells, they have the function of very high cognitive reasoning. I don't think dogs have them. I haven't heard about it yet. And if they do, they have very few. Elephants have a lot of those. And that means that they do high cognitive thinking, abstract thinking, thinking into the future, the past, making plans, understanding causalities, etc. So Anyway, um, I mean, the whole during the whole documentary film, I could see every time they showed the face of that elephant baby, I saw intelligence in it, much more than in the sheep. But the sheep also, you know, you could see how the sheep loved this elephant baby, how they, how they were the closest friends, inseparable, you know, like, like brothers, like mama and baby, you know, it was incredible. And the sheep saved the elephant baby's life because the elephant baby want, didn't want to drink. He was in grief over his mother, who was killed, was probably killed by the the people there that kill, that are hunters that kill wild animals all the time. And some people come there from all over the world, some, some uh, blood sport type of people that pay a lot of money to hunt animals so that they can taxidermy them and hang them up in their house and say that they're that they're somehow badass or something and uh, it's disgusting you know it's uh, this is brain damaged we need to fix that in our society this is definitely completely sick wrong and twisted and needs to be repaired and vipassana meditation is one amazing way to repair the brain or f fix it for the first time in people's lives. Anyway, what happened is when the elephant was two years old and he had already seen how the giraffe was also transported away and brought away, brought back into the wild, and the, it was okay, the, the giraffe hadn't bonded so for so long, only for five months. It was, it was strong enough, but the giraffe was able to make it and survive. And they were all extremely sad. The giraffe was sad and the elephant knew exactly what was going on. You know, he knew that there was this transport trailer standing and he knew exactly what they were doing. And they kind of had to lock the elephant baby uh, away so that he wouldn't go into that trailer with the giraffe because they he still had to do some m more healing and um, the baby elephant just wanted to run right to the over to the giraffe and go with him wherever he was going to go and the sheep too so they had to actually keep him behind a fence and they were both crying after the giraffe like saying don't go away please don't go away you know, just because people don't understand their language doesn't mean that they're just making sounds you know 
uh, we are making sounds too. It's like what Yuji Krishnamurti pointed out. You know, a, a person talking is just like a dog barking. It's, uh, you know, what's the difference? It's like, it's, we don't have that much more important things to say anyway, you know. So it's just a means of communication. And most of our communication is emotional anyway. My whole video is because of emotions. I feel compassion, right? Emotions doesn't mean it is something low, you know. Emotions is what what keeps us somewhat in a balance. Can you imagine if we don't have any emotions anymore? I mean, I don't think people will, will even make it if we didn't have emotions. If everybody was like Jeffrey Dahmer and had no emotions, people would all like cut each other open to see what's inside, like what I did with my dolls when I was a girl. And um, people would just do all kinds of nutty things that would destroy the whole life on earth. And, and to a certain degree, a lot of those people exist and they are doing it. And some of them are in, in very um, high leverage positions where they have legislation over major decision making. For example, um, when it comes to politics, like when it comes to global warming, you know, religious people uh, have seem to have both feet in the door. But it's again, it's uh, the religion is used for that to get the corporate agenda message into the legislation. So th this is all very convoluted, what's happening. And uh, it's important to understand all of these different cause and effect mechanisms that are going on. So when the time came for the baby elephant to be transported to the wild, and the people, they, they meant well, they wanted to rehabilitate him, they wanted him to have babies, they wanted hi him to make the herd stronger, and they're conservationists. They're, they weren't, they, they probably thought a couple of times that it is sad and all of this to separate them, I, I, I know they, I'm sure they did, but they didn't make the bond between the sheep and the elephant an emphasis, which they should have done. And I see this a lot of times, also with the marine mammal centers. I see these types of, you know, these rational type of reasonings that are actually counterproductive in this moment. That's why I say doing things out of compassion, which is an emotion. I'm not saying like irrational emotion uh, reaction. I'm saying doing things out of compassion, you know, the emotion, compassion, love, you know, empathy, you know, out of those feelings. If we didn't have this, things would all completely break apart real fast. And it's already breaking apart in many different places. Species are becoming extinct in a rapid rate. It's never happened before humans had populated to that degree. So what I'm saying is we need to listen to our compassion and we need to cultivate compassion. For those people who don't have the ability to feel compassion, it is extremely important that we cultivate it. Not only does this make an individual person's life richer, you know, there I see a lot of rich people, financially rich people, who don't have the compassion and because of this they, ha they feel a void. There is something missing, you know, and they don't know where to look for this. They, they think they have to look for it in a bordel or in a sadu maso club, you know, something missing. And then after they have spanked someone or they've been spanked, um, and I know somebody who has been in that business. I know someone uh, who I was friends with for a long time because uh, I saw that she wanted to make an effort to become a better person. She was looking for the light, as she said, you know, reading a lot of books. The Buddhists have helped her a whole lot. 
But she told me in that business, it felt very empty afterwards. It's like it's this incessant need to fulfill more and more and more. And then there's this total emptiness plunge after that thrill, that titillation, that excitement wears off, you know. And this total plunge into a void. And this void is because there is no compassion. There, the compassion hadn't been cultivated, it hadn't been nurtured, it had not had the opportunity to develop. It also has to do with when the mother is uh, malnourished or under a lot of stress, uh, the development of the amygdala and the formations that are responsible for for compassion development, when they are not developed well, then it can have long-lasting consequences for that individual when he or she grows up. So, but they found out that the brain has plasticity, that the brain is flexible, that it can regrow or grow for the first time formations that had not had the opportunity to develop yet. This is possible. And just like we can train a muscle, we can train brain function. We can train the brain function of math. We can train the brain function of cognitive reasoning. We can train the brain function of yeah, understanding causalities. And we can also train the brain function of compassion. It is possible. It gives me great hope, this research. And so I just wanted to spread the message about this. So anybody who is very quick to say, oh, you pussies, you know, it's like, no, we're not these pussies. We have compassion, okay? Men and women who have compassion. And it has nothing to do with pussy or with whatever weak or, you know, always throwing the, the, the homophobic words, you know. It has nothing to do with being whatever they think it is. Compassion has to do with love ability. And if once you have developed that, all the haters I'm talking to, once you developed the love ability, you will be amazed how rich your life will become, you know. You don't, you no longer have to be jealous of someone who is, as you say with your own words, better than you. You know, I hear this all the time. You, th you think you're better than everybody else, you know. First of all, nobody says that ever. I've never seen anyone say this. Uh, there's one guy, he made a, had a mocking channel name, you know. Sorry, I'm so great. You know, that's that channel name. And I know why he has that channel name, because he hears this all the time, this, you think you're better than anyone else? It's because he or she, I don't know if he, whether it's a woman or a man, it's an animal rights activist, and he is obviously, he, he cares, and then he gets ac accused of being better. But to the haters, if you become better, you don't need to hate anymore. You don't need to be jealous of other people who are more noble in their actions than you are. You know, there's no need to put them down anymore. So, you know, empower yourselves. Grow the amygdala. Grow the compassion center. Make something out of your life. You, 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 not icons, not Brad Pitt, don't, don't look for, don't look at Ted Nugent or James Hetfield as your role model and, and talking to them or whatever. It doesn't elevate you as a person, you know, it's a, what a terrible misconception that once you talk to a celebrity it will elevate you somehow. Actually, every time I talk to a celebrity, almost every time, I felt I felt like I was plunging in my self-esteem, you know. I felt like I had this nagging feeling like, um, ew, you know, like, why do I have this feeling now that I am, um, I, I need this person uh, to elevate me? It made me feel bad, you know. I felt like, shit, you know, why is this coming up? But I'm going inside of me. I am, I am not 
um, I'm I'm not letting this stay on the on the surface. You know, I I really check that out. I check out my emotions, and that's the only way we can at all make progress with ourselves. Here, this is what I call compassion and love, and this ha this is how this is also David Foster Wallace talked about it you know he in his books how important it is and people often misunderstand it you know they think he's trying to tell them how to live but I'm I'm just telling telling people check it out check out love you know it is wonderful it has nothing to do with gender distribution it is Love. Everyone has their inner child in them. And that's what makes life beautiful. If the inner child is there, present, not covered up by some vanity stuff, some artificial shit, you know, or some peer pressure type of thing that just makes people's lives completely miserable. You know, I've seen people make their lives incredibly miserable just so they can, they can fit in and, and be regarded as tough. You know, men have it particularly hard in that regard because men in the uneducated societies, they um, always get this terrible peer pressure that they have to, they're told by their dads, you know, you need to, uh, you need to do this or that to something terrible, something brutal, like hunt, you know, y they, they tell them, Otherwise, you are just a, a sissy. And I've talked to teenagers. I know. They have told me. And boy, I hope I got some people to rethink this. You know, I, I talked to a seal clubber teenager. He grew up in a seal clubber family. And I constantly blocked him, and he constantly came back. And with the new username because he wanted to talk to me. At some point, I, did, I thought, this kid wants to talk to me, you know. And I saw, I saw that the whole energy about him I felt like that was not an adult. So it was not someone who was completely hardened yet. And so I looked at it, I gave him a chance. When he didn't have the name Hakapik anymore, then I gave him a chance and I, and I said, um, uh, he was complimenting my art and I and I asked him questions about him and he started to tell me and then he said well I am that same person um, be I came back again and again because I wanted to talk to you I kind of like was intrigued about what you have to say and I was so happy and grateful to hear this because I, I saw here is somebody who is giving love a chance, you know, the development of love of, and compassion. To listen to somebody who has compassion, that's the first step, you know, to really listen and not anymore do this blocking themselves off with this, with this tough shield and uh, dismissing everybody as a pussy or sissy or whatever, you know, fag or something, you know, so, but instead going up to the person and saying, who are you really? Let me get to know you, you know. And that's what I do. I do that. I give everybody that chance, no matter who you are. You could be a mass murderer. And um, it doesn't matter. I want to talk to people. I want to help people. I want to get pe give people the chance to heal. And that's why I wrote my book. So back to the elephant. What happened is when the elephant, when the time came for the elephant to be transported, they had the trailer there and the elephant and the sheep, they were, were the only ones left there and they were inseparable and first they put a fence between them to kind of like wean them off, which is, they mean well, but it doesn't work that way. The elephant is so intelligent, he knew exactly what they were doing, you know. And they were sitting next to each other with that with that chicken wire fence between them. I saw they were sitting next to each other, next to each other with the fence between. But I can imagine that the elephant put his his trunk through that fence and reached over to feel that sheep, to know that 
he's there, they can still touch each other, you know, it's just, just thinking about it, it's just the most horrific story I have ever seen, you know, it is so incredibly heartbreaking. It's just, it's like someone who cares just feels like they are twisted inside out, you know, kind of like a, like a doll that's, uh, that's opened up and tur everything turned inside out. That's how I felt last night. And so the elephant, every time they showed the, f the face, I could see it in his eyes. He knew exactly with that trunk hanging down, these eyes on the side, you know, this big, huge forehead, you know, intelligent. He just knew he looked like this. Mm. He knew, he knew exactly what's going on. He looked around the corner of that trailer. They had, they were giving him the food in it to lure him in. And he knew exact, it's, it's kind of like these people, he, the elephant w was way smarter than the people, you know. The people were like, come here, elephant. And the elephant, I know what you're doing. I feel sorry for you, you know. You don't even get it, you know. I love sheep, you know. Albert was his name. And the elephant's name is uh, Temba, which means hope in the native language. And so... Temba loved Albert, and Albert loved Temba, and they did not want to be separated. And so the elephant, the whole time, he knew what they were doing. And um, so the day, I think it was the day before he was being transported, the elephant's intestines twisted. And they tried to help him, they gave him pain medicine, but he died the next day. The, I think he died the very day that they wanted to transport him from the twisted, twisted intestines and they could not fix it. That there, would, that there was no time at all to untangle this in an operation. He would not make it. It uh, happens to dogs sometimes too. And to me, this is pretty crystal clear. I mean, that's not a coincidence. That's not just accidentally happening at that particular time. That's pretty obvious. And I saw it in the elephant's face. I saw already grief in his face, knowing that he was going to be transported away. Where he was going to go, he didn't even know. He didn't know where the giraffe went. He just knew he was going to be separated from Albert. And the grief over this caused his intestines to twist. And what I want to say to people, I left a comment, I said, don't ever do this again. We need to learn from this, not to do this again. When you do conservationism, you have to be, n as the number one priority, you have to be an animal rights activist as a conservationist. Conservation is good, but if you kill the animal in the, if the animal dies in the process, then nothing is gained, you know. So the elephant, when the elephant is becomes socialized with people as a baby or to another animal, then sometimes the bond is so intense that they cannot be separated. And if, if they want to bring him into the wild, then they should bring the, the bonding animal with him. You know, they should have brought the sheep and the elephant together to the other elephants. And they, maybe the other elephants would have protected the sheep, you know. You don't know. I mean, you don't, you don't look at these possibilities, you know. Elephants shield their offspring. They would see the sheep as the baby, you know, and they would, they, they, gr they form circles around the babies. The whales do that too. So, they protect them from predatory animals. So anyway, um, I had to make this video because it is, um, it, is, it is so incredibly heartbreaking to see this and it doesn't need to be repeated. You know, I know you guys mean well, I know you're awesome people for, what, for all the work that you're doing. I just want you to become more aware of the psychology of their bonding ability is even stronger than in humans. Therefore, they need to be 
staying together. They need to not be separated and never separate a baby dolphin from a mother. And um, the, the industry, the, the showbiz industry is promoting this. And that's why Shujo is separated from her mother. The mother died out of grief. And Shuju is in that dolphin museum in, in Taiji, in a small pool, suffering and waiting to be brought to an amusement park so she can serve show business and suffer more. That needs to stop. We need to stop these things, you know. And um, any conservationist who is they're doing very good work, they need to know not to separate the animals. My appeal is to all people who are conservationists or activists or marine mammal volunteers or um, anyone who works with animals or at the, at the veterinary office, never separate the animals. Never make animals be isolated. Never put them in tiny confinements for a prolonged time. This is very critical. Never separate those animals that have bonded with a human or another animal. Take care.